Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature. I'm Jennifer E. Blaine, and today is March 9th. Today in garden history, we celebrate the birthday of the English writer, member of parliament, and farmer, William Cobbett. He was born on this day, March 9th in 1763. In Parliament, William fought for agrarian reform, and he did this through his regular writings called Rural Rides. And this is where he shared what he saw while taking horseback rides throughout rural England. As for William, he never forgot his rural roots, and he was also a lifelong gardener. He once wrote, How much better during a long and dreary winter for daughters and even sons to assist or attend their mother in a greenhouse than to be seated with her at cards or in the blubberings over a stupid novel or at any other amusement that can possibly be conceived. And William also wrote, If well managed, nothing is more beautiful than the kitchen garden. And today is also the birthday of the German botanist and plant physiologist Wilhelm Friedrich Philipp Pfeffer, who was born on this day, March 9th in 1845. Wilhelm was born in his father's apothecary. He grew up and learned every aspect of the business, which had been in his family for generations. One of his childhood friends noted, In those days, it was not yet customary to obtain drugs in cut and powdered form. And so Wilhelm spent hours cutting roots and herbs and pulverizing dried drugs with a heavy pestle in a mortar. In addition to life at the apothecary, Wilhelm loved collecting plants in the Alps. His early study of plants and his natural curiosity set the stage for his in-depth plant experiments as an adult. In terms of plant physiology, Wilhelm is remembered for the pfeffer pot or the pepper pot, which was his creation. He used it to measure osmotic pressure in plant cells. And today is also the birthday of the German plant breeder, writer, and garden designer, Carl Furster, who was born on this day, March 9th in 1874. When Carl turned 18, he took over his family's Berlin nursery, which was a bit of a mess, but he quickly streamlined the business by just simplifying his plant inventory. Although Carl loved all plants, he was especially drawn to tough, low-maintenance, hardy perennials. And Carl used those three factors, toughness, low-maintenance, and hardiness, to determine whether a plant would be sold in his nursery. So he was looking for beauty, resilience, and endurance. Today, Carl is most remembered in Carl Furster Grass. And the story goes that Carl was on a train when he spied the grass growing along the tracks. So he frantically pulled the emergency brake, stopped the train, and then quickly collected the specimen that now bears his name. And back in 2001, and I remember this, Carl Furster Grass was the perennial plant of the year in the United States. Carl's plant standards and his appreciation for low-maintenance spaces with year-long seasonal interest helped to shape the new German garden style of garden design. And in case you're wondering, a Carl Furster garden had some signature plants. Grasses, of course, delphinium, and flocks. And naturally, all of these plants were favorites of Carl's in his breeding work. Carl once wrote, grasses are the hair of Mother Earth. And he also wrote, 
A garden without flocks is not only a sheer mistake, but a sin against summer. And if you know of a quote that Carl wrote regarding the delphinium, please forward it to me. Well, Carl lived to the ripe old age of 96, and looking back, it's staggering to think that Carl spent nearly nine decades gardening. But for Carl, it wasn't enough. He once wrote, In my next life, I'd like to be a gardener once again. The job was too big for just one lifetime. And today we also celebrate the birthday of a great English author and garden designer, one of my favorites, Vita Sackville West. She was born on this day, March 9th in 1892. In 1930, Vita and her husband, the diplomat and journalist Harold Nicholson, bought Sissinghurst Castle, at least what was left of it. Together, they restored the house and created their famous garden, which was given to the National Trust in 1967. But it was there that Vita explored the depths of her own creativity. And when she came up with the idea for a sunset garden, she wrote, I used to call it the sunset garden in my own mind before I even planted it up. Vita's sunset garden included flowers with warm citrus colors, like the oranges, yellows, and reds of dahlias, salvias, cannas, and tulips. Vita also created a white garden, one of the most difficult gardens to design, maintain, and pull off. And the main reason for that is because after flowering, most white blooms don't age well. They brown or turn yellow as they wither and die on the plant. But I have to say that 10 years ago, I helped a friend install a white garden. And when it was in bloom, it was truly spectacular. During World War II, there came a point when Vita and Harold were convinced that a German invasion of Britain was likely. Vita planted 11,000 daffodils. It was her message of defiance to the enemy. In 1955, Vita was honored with the Veatch Memorial Medal. She died seven years later in 1962. It was Vita Sackville West who wrote, The waking bee, still drowsy on the wing, will sense the opening of another year and blunder out to seek another spring. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Art of Edible Flowers by Rebecca Sullivan. This book came out in 2018, and the subtitle is Recipes and Ideas for Floral Salads, Drinks, Desserts, and More. This sweet little book is a fun recipe book of the many ways that flowers can be incorporated into drinks and edibles. And I've had it out in my kitchen for the last three summers. Rebecca's recipes include a rose and lavender cocktail syrup, a jasmine and green tea ice cream, lavender and orange cheesecake, pumpkin carpaccio with mustard flower sauce, artichoke flour with borage butter, fermented elderflower fizz, and a soothing poppy milk, just to name a few. The recipes in this book are simple, creative, and elegant, and they're sure to inspire you to come up with your own ways to use edible flowers in your own creations. This book is 80 pages of edible, beautiful, tasty blossoms. You can get a copy of The Art of Edible Flowers by Rebecca Sullivan and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for $12. Finally, we end the show today with a botanic spark that celebrates the birthday of Luis Barragan, the Mexican architect and engineer who was born on this day, March 9th in 1902. 
In 1980, Luis won the Pritzker Prize, the highest award in architecture. In 1948, he designed and built his own home with cement after being inspired by local modernist architecture. And in 2004, the Luis Barragan House was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. In addition to architecture, Luis loved landscapes. He once wrote, I don't divide architecture, landscape, and gardening. To me, they are one. And Luis also wrote, A garden must combine the poetic and the mysterious with a feeling of serenity and joy. Well, that's it for today's show. Just remember that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link over at the website or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Hi there, Daily Gardeners. I just wanted to let you know that I will be speaking at the Friends of the State Botanical Garden of Georgia annual meeting in Athens, Georgia on March 25th at 7 p.m. And there's a reception before this event at 6.30. Anyway, this is their 50th anniversary and I'll be giving a presentation on some of the women who influenced botanical illustration and who created marvelous botanical botanical porcelain art, which is now truly a dying art. In fact, in the United States, there are no longer any porcelain studios in operation. All of the beam studios have closed. And so these pieces are only going to become more scarce and more precious over time. Now, in Athens, there is a brand new porcelain and decorative arts museum at the Center for Art and Nature, and it's right next to the visitor center at the Botanical Garden of Georgia. This porcelain and decorative arts museum houses the collection of Dean Day Sanders, a passionate gardener and art collector with an extensive concentration in botanical porcelain. And so this museum is special because it's the first of its kind to integrate decorative arts in a garden setting to celebrate nature. Now, if you decide that you'd like to be at this event, all you need to do is check today's show notes or the Facebook group, the Daily Gardener community over at Facebook, or the newsletter, because I'll put links to this event in all of those places. And if you do register, let me know, because it would be fun to have some Daily Gardeners in the audience. I'm going to have a little bit of free time, and it would be great to connect with you. We could tour the gardens together have a little meet and greet, grab a coffee, etc. Anyway, it would be great to get to see you there. We'll celebrate these wonderful botanical artists, see the beautiful botanical porcelain, and get a chance to hang out. What could be better? So one more time, the meeting is on March 25th on a Friday at 7 p.m. Hope to see you there.